Welcome to the Heavy Spoilers Show, I'm your host, Haha. <laughs> In this video we're breaking down Westworld Season 4 Episode 1. The latest entry is extremely complex and filled with a lot of hidden details, easter eggs and references to the prior seasons. There's also a ton of theories that I have for what's going on and how the character at the end has managed to come back. Now we open much in the same way that the third season did, in that we watched an extremely rich man being taunted by a host until they did what the host wanted them to. We discovered that he was an abusive wife beater and though the stories aren't exactly the same, they do share some similarities. We join a cartel leader and learn that they took over the Hoover Dam with the rest of his gang. As with most Westworld openings, we start with the character getting ready and here he heads out to meet none other than the man in black. The cartel senior talks about how much of a nice guy William is and as we learn in the previous seasons, the guy, he actually was. It was only when he got to the park that the darker side came out of him and he turned unrecognisable. He'd set up several charitable foundations in the real world which guests even thanked him for, but he was such an evil guy his wife ended her own life when she saw what he'd been up to. He also arrives in the same vessel that Serac used to travel in when he'd hover above humanity, judging and deciding the fates of all. If you cast your mind back to the ending of the last season, we had a post credit scene in which he arrived at Dallas headquarters located in Dubai. Here he was seemingly killed by a replica of himself, which this version that arrives seems to also be. Now if you cast your mind back to the previous season, then you'll remember that William lost some of his fingers and at the end of season 3, he wore a glove that covered this wound. As this version gets off the drone, we can see that he doesn't have this, but he has all his fingers, showing that this is indeed a host. I actually binged all three seasons in the lead up to this new one and though we don't get any answers as to who exactly this doppelganger is, I do have my theories. Now you might remember that William had been testing a way to immortalise people in host bodies by copying their minds. This was seen through James Delos but unfortunately he didn't make it past the fidelity phase which was put in place to see if they truly replicated someone and could be released. I have a theory that this copy might have been the William version of that and unlike James he passed this crucial part. He also says at one point a very important line about the dam. Have you seen it before? When I was a kid, road trip with my parents. Hasn't changed a bit. This sticks out because these clone bodies retain the memories of the person that they were duplicates of. The entirety of Westworld was set up with implants in the hats that scanned someone's brain and this made a copy of them. This was later used by Rehoboam to map out the world and plot courses for humanity. However, it also duplicated their entire brains and him having childhood memories could further point to this. The Hale copy in season 2 and 3 didn't because she was just Dolores, whereas it seems like it might be a genuine copy of William. Either way, one thing that we saw at the end of the third season was a lab full of hosts being built and this could explain why there are several characters returning in this entry, most notably Teddy. He ended up ending himself in season 2 and he was completely absent for the last one. However, he's back now along with a number of other older hosts, so potentially Haloris ended up resurrecting him with William as her number 2. This could be used as a way to manipulate the original Dolores and we even see him saving her at the end of the episode. In the park her side quest was started by her dropping a can which was then picked up by someone and this then started the loop with them. This is actually used later on in the episode with the mysterious character she meets. Potentially it's all set up as a way to manipulate her by Hale but we'll discuss this later on in the video. Now at the dam we get some hints to the plan that's going on. William wishes to buy it in order to obtain the data banks and information that was stolen by what I believe was the original Hale. This contained the aforementioned copies of everyone's brain who visited the park, along with the data on how the hosts were created. This isn't confirmed in the entry, but William does refer to the person who stole them as being a she and that she's dead. In season 3 we discover that Hale was working alongside Serac and she of course died in the park and was copied by Dolores. Due to Hale's death the data can't be opened or decrypted, and he says that he just wants to keep it there. There's also another thing that it clearly houses, judging by the trailers, but I'll talk about this later on in the video in case you don't want future parts of the season spoiled. Now this scene also gives us a rough timeline, with William mentioning that the data was stolen 8 years ago. 7 years is also mentioned several times as being when season 3 happened, so this gives us a rough idea of the events. Now there's also a pattern on the floor that looks like it's somewhat based on the maze which has some significance in this entry. The cartel end up turning him down and he gives this badass warning. Sell me this lump of concrete today. Or, or you give it to me for nothing. Tomorrow. Gonna tell you guys, you either subscribe today or you might subscribe tomorrow. Now moving on, the boss then returns home to find a swarm of flies, which of course bears a lot of symbolism. 
These flies very much represented a fault in the programming as the hosts were not built to swap them away and thus they caused issues. Dolores did swap one away at the end of the first episode and thus she remained in her loop. Now flies also bear symbolism in dreams, namely one breaking free of the confines that one finds themselves in. Though we don't know exactly what's going on here, the cartel boss collapses and he wakes up almost as if it's from a dream. And see, I told you there was some symbolism there. What, what you mean it's a reach? Now, similar to how the host went wild and attacked their masters, he does too, though there's clearly something off with him. I don't believe that he's a host, and yet somehow William has managed to program him into not only killing them, but also himself. From here, we cut to the titles, and this time we see new graphics of the tower, which several characters discuss in this entry, and it's also what the lampposts are modeled after. Now the host in this opening is also important on a symbolic level, keep keep using that word because it's Westworld and it's, it's highbrow entertainment and normally in the credits it sinks into the fluid whereas here it's rising out of it. This is showing the quote unquote rise of the machines and it, it's highbrow stuff I'm telling you, you wouldn't pick that up if you, you weren't with me so stick with me. And there's also several clips of people stuck inside cylinders, circular, almost loop like because it's symbolic. Anyway, it's a Westworld, it's a Westworld, it's a Westworld, it's a Westworld. Now from here we cut to Dolores waking up. This is iconography that's popped up at several points throughout the series and we of course had it appear with the character in the first episode. Maeve also did it when she took focus later on in the season and in season 3 we got a shot similar to this when she escaped the simulation. There was then Caleb who also did it in the series and it's often set up as a way to introduce us to either a character or a new version of them. This scene is shot extremely similar to her entrance in the first episode with her getting out of bed and going through the house. However, this time she's in the real world and living in an apartment with her roommate. She's changed her hair colour and name to Christina, which Evan Rachel Wood has described as being a completely different kind of Dolores to what's come before. She's much more vulnerable and whereas the prior version was ready to kill everyone due to White being part of her personality, yeah, she's sort of a damsel in distress. We get a subtle nod to the park when her roommate asks her whether she prefers white or black shoes, and this was of course mirrored in the hat choice that all the guests were given. She has several missed calls, and this is thought to potentially be a bot, which wouldn't be the first time a character was revealed to be one, eh, hey, but not having that? Now Caleb also got calls from bots in the first season, and them doing this telemarketing thing is common, even if we know that's not what's really going on here. Now she also has this strange earring that we later see her boss also wearing. At the end of the episode we see this allows her to log and record stories and she ends up taking it off showing that she's no longer tied to her job. As Dolores exits her apartment we also see the word warehouse behind a tree which is a nice little play on how she and the other hosts of course came from one. Dolores is also wearing a similar colour coat to the dress that she had on in the park. As for the world, seems much happier now that everyone has escaped their loops. However, we see with Caleb that people very much wonder whether things have actually changed. There's the automated driverless cars that we saw pop up in the last season and she passes a homeless man who also mentions the tower. Can you see it? Can you see it? He asks if people can see it, possibly meaning that filters have been put on people so that it's invisible. We saw in season 3 how this was done in the case of Caleb so that he believed he was assassinating certain targets that were foreign enemies when really they were just American citizens. Interestingly, Dolores is now a video game story author and she works at Olympiad Entertainment. This idea of video games and storylines is layered throughout this episode and we even get a cover of video games by Lana Del Rey. It's you, it's you, the video's for you so if you enjoy it, hit the, hit the f***ing thumbs up you now the word Olympiad actually derives from the Olympic Games and it means the four year interval between them. Olympus was also the home of the gods and if it's true that Dolores is writing the stories of people in the real world then she would very much be classed as one. Interestingly the episode is called Auguries and this has ties to both omens and prophecies. Dolores could very much be seen as being able to read into this as she can potentially predict people's stories and how things will go. The video game company, they just want her doing sex and violence much like the park but Dolores, she wants to sit about writing stories that are allegories for her and her father Abernathy. Dolores was at her happiest when she was stood on the porch waiting with him for Teddy to return. She brings up how she's much better at writing stories for NPCs, which is because she was one, whereas the guests were the players. We learn she wrote a previous story about someone who lost everything and this ended in bloodshed in which everyone died, again riffing on clear metaphors of characters in the park. We then cut to the wilderness to find Maeve hiding out. Should have just done a Dolores and dyed your hair and then 
no one would have recognised you for about seven years. However, we see her living this solitary lifestyle and basically doing a world from Breaking Bad. She begins to meditate and sees flashes of her daughter as well as the maze. You also get cuts of Hector and his death, and I think he'll probably be brought back as a way to manipulate her along with Clementine. Her favourite saying about the new world is also dropped in. This is the new world, and in this world, you can be whoever the fuck you want. Oop, bit of swearing there. Now, she and Caleb ended up taking down Serac and his forces after they inserted Dolores' mind into Rehoboth. This could explain why she carries the foresight to be able to write people's stories, as that machine of course used an algorithm to predict them. We discover that she and Caleb travelled out to the original Rehoboth that was shown early on in Season 3, and that they destroyed it. Caleb was badly injured at it, and these shots were reminiscent of his friend dying in the previous season. Stop, it's theory time. Now they obviously show that he seemingly dies in this scene, right? But that tension is immediately stripped away in the next one with Caleb's return. It's weird that they did this, and I have a theory, if you will, that this might actually be Caleb's death and that he could have put his mind into a host like what Holoris did with William. However, those cheeky buggers at Westworld, they know we like our theory time, so they might have done this on purpose to make us guess that he's dead due to the similarities to the third season and also our need to pick apart every single thing in the world, the Westworld, if you will. Anyway, that's it, and uh, theory time. Theory time. Theory time. Theory time. Now Maeve ends up causing a blackout in the town which alerts William and co to her location. She of course had advanced enough to the point where she could control machines and this is actually how she escaped Serac overpowering her in season 3. Cut to Caleb still working construction like how he was in the third season. Whereas in that he had a robot buddy though, yeah he's got another human because we discover all the machines were scrapped. Guess it's difficult to trust them after once just try to murder everyone and there's lip service paid to the 7 year anniversary. They won their freedom but he's still stuck in the same job, not advancing at all and basically still doing the same loop. This is shown by the shot of him sitting on the edge of the skyscraper which mirrors the one from the first season in which he sat on the girder. This was of course a nod to the workers sat on top of one titled lunch atop a skyscraper. He goes to meet his daughter, yeah he'd have to have had her before he became a host if we're right with the theory time, but turns out he's training her to shoot against her mother's wishes. On the wall at his home we see a parody of the Banksy painting with a machine controlling a human who is controlling a drone. This is symbolic, eh? because Rehoboam controlled humanity and they controlled the hosts. There's also My Brain My Choice which is of course a play on the saying My Body My Choice. Brain is crossed out because Rehoboam used to be a machine that would control the destiny of humanity. Maeve travels out to Woody's Goodies which is a real shop so eh? learn something new every day. Now after learning her quote unquote friends are in town, she decides not to bury the hatchet and heads out to take them on. They are led by Colonel Brigham, who you might recognise as being from the second season. He was a high ranking member of the Confederados and again this shows that William is adapting host from the park. Maeve ends up sending in the truck with a can of propane in the back which she shoots in order to make it explode. This was something that we saw being used as a tactic in the park when William and Dolores sent in a dead man on the back of a horse filled with explosives that they then shot and blew up. She ends up scanning Brigham's memories and as we learn in season 1, a host memory is perfect. This is why Dolores had such vivid flashbacks to the point that she couldn't tell what was real and what wasn't and Maeve scans through his data logs. We see William and also a mysterious man at a mansion. Tried slowing down the footage to see who this is but I can't quite make them out. Later on though, Maeve talks about William being interested in a senator out in California so potentially this could be who that is. Now Dolores returns home and she gets called out by Maya to prepare for her date. She hears a noise outside and sees a picture of the maze likely left behind by Teddy. The date is a bit bleh, a bit like one of those where you're bored and just going through the motions, like my marriage, <laughs> I'm in that. And she refutes the point that the background characters in her games are just cannon fodder. Obviously referring to the park and not only is she disappointed with the date, she's also disappointed with reality. Dolores wanted to do nothing but escape the park and be free, but she's realised life ain't all it's cracked up to be. He mentions tabs at several points and we saw these in the third season as being common drugs. These had the ability to alter one's mind state, such as the one that made Caleb hallucinate movie soundtracks. After she leaves she gets a phone call from Peter and he also mentions the tower. This could be sending out signals from what may be Dolores or it could be Hale. Remember that they both came from the same code and thus people could end up getting the pair confused. If Alorus ended up building a tower that sends out signals showing people their plans mapped out by Rehoboam, it could potentially send them insane. 
He states that he lost his job and wife and that she made him and the others do bad things. He says they're part of a game and it is possible she's writing stories that get picked up by the tower, heard by those involved, and then these make them slowly go insane. Got no idea what's going on with it, mate, if I'm being honest, but it wouldn't be Westworld if I did, and I hope the stuff so far will make you forgive me. Now, Dolores is saved by Teddy, and mirroring her attack, we also see one later happen to Caleb and his family. This idea of parents reading bedtime stories to their kids was seen in Arnold slash Bernard's kid, and also hailing her son. Outside, Frankie comes across a host that was part of the bandit group from the first season. Really weird seeing this guy back, and yeah, sticking with the season 3 post credit scene theory that, that Hale's just sending them all out. Now he is saved by Maeve and she tells him about William, which is when they head out. Turns out his paranoia was justified and he very much bears the responsibility of things going haywire. In the morning, Dolores wakes up, goes through her routine once more, and she sees Peter end his own life. Dolores seems completely shocked by this, again making me think that it has nothing to do with her. He asks her if it's up to him or if she wrote his death too. Is this up to me, or did you write this too? This makes me think that he's trying to show he wonders if he even has any more choices, or if they've all been taken away. That night, Dolores goes out to her balcony, and she starts to write a new story. This is something that relates to Frankie, Maeve, and Caleb's wife, along with her. Again, love the video game's music, gave me goosebumps, and we close out with Teddy. So, lots of things going on with the ending, and lots of theories to talk about. It's even possible that Dolores isn't actually in the real world and her brain may be inside Rehoboam or a simulation which explains Teddy's return. At the end of season 3, that's how he left her and it would make sense with everything being in a loop. This would explain why people are also stuck doing certain things and how they can be told how their lives will end. This hints towards a simulation when the group of dudes talk about this being their first time. The place is fucking wild. I can't believe this is your first time. Come on. This is similar to people entering the park, and the logo for Olympiad also looks very similar to the Delos one. We know that there's an 8 year time span that this story can fit into, but what if it goes beyond that, and we're in the 100 years that the dam can power the servers for? Potentially, this version of Dolores could be far into the future, which will sync up with Bernard's timeline, who we still don't know what happened to. This entire thing could be a park simulation, or absolutely nothing, and it's a big reach. Also, forgot to point out earlier that the painting in Dolores' home also reflects her doing paintings in the park. Sent that bit to my editors before I realised, so just easier banging it in here at the end instead of having to talk to people for one minute longer than I already do, because they're a bunch, they're a bunch of f chumps. See you, chump. Now, I want to talk about the trailer for the show for the next part of the video, and I know some of you don't like me just diving into this stuff, so this is your spoilery warning for what's to come. Now, in it, you still here? Now in it, we see Hale talking to William, and she says that they can control humanity now. This is retribution for them controlling the hosts, and it might completely debunk what we said earlier in the video, so I wasted your time there. Now, she could have the real one still, and be controlling him at the start of the episode. This would explain how they controlled the cartel boss, and the flies may be some form of nanomachine... <laughs> F sake, going off the deep end here with the theories, but we also see Caleb getting swarmed by them as well. Other important shots in it feature the tower, and we also see William approaching the dam, which we see houses the sublime. This is very much the entrance to heaven for the hosts, and the data banks clearly store that too, and the fact that William can see it also likely means that he's a host. Anyway, those are the main things, and I loved how this was very much a soft reboot of the series again. Lots of stuff in the past seasons gets really convoluted, and I know people will just forget it, so I like that they kind of tone things back. It was basically, it was a Westworld, wasn't it, when you think about it? Because it had those great character moments, symbolism, and also something teased out that lets you just run wild with the fan theories. Really enjoyed it for the first episode. It was a Westworld, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on it below. Now, we are running a competition right now and giving away three copies of Everything Everywhere all at once on the 15th of July. And all you have to do to be on the chance of winning is like the video, make sure you subscribe with notifications on, and drop a comment below with your thoughts on the episode. We pick the comments at random at the end of the month and the winners of the last one are on screen right now. So if that's you, then message me on Twitter at Heavy Spoilers. If you want something else that messes with your head a bit, then check out our breakdown of the Umbrella Academy Season 3 and that crazy ending. We try to clear up exactly what happens in it, so if you watched that and had questions, then definitely head over there right after this. Without the way, thanks for sticking through the video. I've been Paul, and I'll see you next time. Take care, peace.